good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. So we'll try to, uh, to do a joint presentation, not to bore you too much, at least with a change of voice, hopefully it'll be less um, boring. So um, what are we going to talk about? Um, the scope of our paper, if you read the abstract, was to compare modeling traditions in cultural heritage and digital humanities. And this is a very wide um, scope, as you can appreciate, so we decided to focus it on quite specific um, modeling practices, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The idea, though, in the longer term, is to compare these communities at a wider level. So what is meant by modeling and models, more in general, and how are modeling languages and theories created and used in these two communities? Um, of course, to, to, to face these issues, we had, first of all, to ask ourselves, what do we mean by modeling? And that's not a very simple question. We heard, actually, today already mentioning the word model and modeling many times. Um, even the term data model, which in itself is more focused than model in general, is already quite ambiguous and used with many different meaning, meanings in digital modeling. For instance, database models are considered data models, how you organize your structure in a database, tables, and so on. But also a conceptual model is a model, even if it's actually quite a different animal, um, which includes, of course, inferences, structures, and semantic uh, knowledge, and so on. Another interesting um, relationship we wanted to investigate was the focus on the process, so creating models rather than the products, which is what normally, let's say, computer scientists uh, focus on. So more on the dynamic nature and epistemic value of creating models rather than on the data models themselves, so modeling versus model. And another concept we, we also found useful for our analysis was this, this distinction between models of versus model for, which is by no means something we invented. We will say something more about this later. So to ground our analysis, we used some um, theory. So I'm afraid uh, you, we will move a little bit from practice at the beginning to explain um, the settings we are working on. And then we will look more into specific practices. But before the theory, we would want to say a few words about this distinction between model of and model for. And in a way, based on uh, all, both research in computer science and in digital humanities, and comes out of anthropology and other areas as well, you have, in a way, a movement from an object, which for our purpose we can say is a real-world object, to a model, and then you have a movement from model to real-world object. And a very straightforward example of this is that you have a historical statue. And that is a physical object, obviously. And by making a three-dimensional model of that object, uh, the black thing is supposed to be a, a, cloud, uh, a point cloud, which represents a 3D model of this object. Based on the 3D model, which is then the 3D model is a model of the original object. Whereas if the 3D model is then used to create replica, to sail for tourists, for example, this is a slightly silly example, but still, then the 3D model is a model for this replica. So a real-world object is modeled into a model which is a model of the real-world object, but then it can be used as a model for new real-world objects. And these also work in more abstract areas, as we will see a little bit later. Yes, so we use this um, um, theory that is based on a semiotic understanding of mo how models work uh, by Krellman and Lapman, who based it on other semiotic theories and philosophy of sciences analysis and so on. And the reason why we use it is that because it's quite a general theory, so it encompasses the meaning of models in very different um, scenarios and settings. So from models in sciences, like, I don't know, molecular models, to uh, mathematical um, equations, to art models, or indeed narrative structures for the purpose of uh, textual analysis. Um, and the simple idea is that basically what we do when we model an object or a set of objects is select some features that are interesting for, our, for what we want to do. So in a way, it is a very subjective um, process. Um, extract these features and make them, select them into 
a representation which is our model. And this relationship between the characteristics of the model and the characteristic of the objects is a representative relationship, is a similarity, and allow us to, by studying the model, understanding better the object. For instance, before we saw the example of the newspaper um, uh, recognition, well, segmentation process where um, our colleague um, talked about a general graphical model, layout model, which could be used to represent different kind of objects. So that's an idea of a model, the graphical model of layout, which is applied to a different kind of objects. So actually on that side, you could have a set of objects, not necessarily one object. What's very important for us as humanists is that, of course, this kind of, of semiotic structure is considered within a context. So there are not really objective models, but there are models situated within a specific understanding of the world, a specific theory, a specific language. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Text Encoding Initiative? Okay, some of you. So now we move from the modeling in theory to the modeling in practice. So how did you use this theory in our context. So I will say a little bit something about the Text Encoding Initiative, which is um, a set of guidelines uh, that focus on text, different kind of text. And the, the aim of these guidelines is to represent, encode uh, some features of text, different kind of features you, you can find normally in text that are in useful, interesting for humanities purposes, but not only also for practitioners in libraries and so on. And the idea is that these, these encoding uh, um, guidelines will allow uh, an encoder, a user, to represent different textual features without necessarily making an assumption about the existence of any of the phenomena described in that text, of any of, of the names, for instance. Um, the TI started as a research project, it was a collaborative project across uh, Europe and America in 1987. Um, and the first release of the guidelines, which at the time were called P1, happened in 1990. And then from 2001, it became a consortium, and it released um, various um, versions of these guidelines. Uh, I was personally involved in some, in, let's say, the most recent release, which is the P5. Um, only part of these guidelines is an ISO standard for a specific reason. Um, the old guidelines are based on a specific formalism, which is XML. It used to be SGML, then became XML. Potentially, the TI could be expressed in other formalism, but in actual fact, it's actually quite constrained by this specific formalism. Um, it's got a board of directors uh, will overtake, let's say, the strategical uh, decisions of the TI, and then it has a technical council, which takes care of uh, making decisions about the development of the guidelines, and various special interest groups on specific aspects of the guidelines. And most importantly, behind it, there is a quite strong community, which is quite hybrid and varied. So it includes uh, linguists, historians, computer scientists, uh, librarians, information scientists, and so on. So this is about the TI. Uh, what's interesting is that, is that based on the, on the graph I showed before, we could define modeling practices in the TI as what is normally called document analysis. Although here I'm not talking, of course, about automatic document analysis, at least not mainly but um, analysis done on the documents by humans. And what's interesting, what's it, what we want to highlight is that indeed how this document analysis is done reflects specific semantics of the standard. So when we use TI, we're already somehow subscribing to a certain perspective on text. And therefore also contingent theories and practices. For instance, if you're building a digital edition using TI, you are somehow also abiding to the editorial practices that are formalized within those guidelines. And this is something that is not always maybe made evident. How many of you know about CDOC CRM? So it's slightly less popular. This is uh, basically a formal core ontology used to represent real-world objects based on real lists view of the world, as they are represented in museum information systems, although its use also stretches beyond that. So one of the differences between TEI and CDOC CRM is that CRM is based on information systems very specifically, whereas TEI, in a way, can be used for any text. A CDOC as an organization is, uh, is the International Documentation Section of ICOM, the International Museum Federation, and was established in 1950 and it's been working on museum documentation standards 
Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, the work on an ER model for museum documentation was basically given up. And uh, the work was started on a conceptual reference model, which is an ontology in computer science sense. And the first release was made in 1999. It was later established as an ISO standard. And uh, for the last few years, there have been um, lots of work on integrating this with, uh, with the library standard, Ferber, and uh, the Ferber family of standards. Uh, it's open uh, with respect to formalism, so it's not tied to any kind of implementation, although RDF, for the time being, is a very popular way of, of using it. Uh, the organization is a working group uh, called the Special Interest Group under the organization CDOC. Uh, so the community is based on this organization, basically, although its use is, is spreading quite wide beyond that. Uh, so it's an ontology uh, or a conceptual model, which in this sense can be taken as meaning more or less the same. Uh, and uh, in addition to be a model of museum practice or museum documentation practice, modeling also work happens when somebody is mapping a museum, specific museum system into CRM because the mapping pr purpose in itself represents the semantics of the information system in a way which makes it a modeling, modeling exercise. Uh, this is something we will not go into details on in this, in this short paper. So uh, there has been a work for around 10 years on a pragmatic, mostly, integration between these two standards under the auspice of the TI Special Interest Group for Ontologies, which was, it was established to facilitate mapping and integration uh, between uh, different uh, external ontologies and TEIs and encoding system for texts in 2004. And it has been uh, made some previous comparisons between TI and CDOC CRM uh, mainly to try to uh, assist TEI in, uh, in changing some of the practices for some specific elements. Uh, this happened at class level. Uh, the idea uh, here is to connect this to ongoing project, which accounts for what you could call textual mobility, uh, which is in a way integrating textual-based material hand-encoded in TEI into the semantic web which means that by using the XML structure of the TI document and connecting that to formal ontologies, you can then again connect it to the web of data, uh, said in a few words. Yeah, so this is an example of a project um, I was involved with um, quite well now, a long time ago, to start in 2007, Henry III Finders project, where we tried to do exactly that. So we, we had our TI XML to represent the text in its physical and logical structures. These are um, chancery rolls of the 13th century that we were transcribing. Actually, they were translations from Latin into English. And they had a very specific structure, so they were uh, entries with transact transactions. So we, did we use the TI model to represent the logical and physical structure of these documents and also some of the semantic contents, for instance, place, name, uh, subjects, um, and so on. And then we also developed an RDFI ontology, which was connected with the text. So we, we extracted some information from the TI XML to populate this ontology to make, in a way, indeed, the text more mobile. So to create um, a network of associations, for instance, across place names, so we could represent a hierarchy of places in England in the 13th century. Um, or also, very importantly, adding additional statements the historians wanted to um, attach to the text, to the sources and interpretative layers. I'm not sure how much you can see here, but basically there is an example of a person name with a place name, so a toponym within it in the first box, and then in the second box there is a, in black again the text of the, of, the, of, the, of the source, the medieval source, and we use a specific element in TI to say that this, that was a referring string to a specific theme, a specific subject. Um, of course, a subject that the historians were interested in, so we're not talking about a top-down hierarchy, well, it was a top, sorry, we're not talking about bottom-up uh, extraction of subjects like in the previous example, but this is a top-down. Uh, analysis of subjects, which is then applied to the text. And, and some of this information was then extracted um, to populate, uh, as I was saying, this ontology. 
where we had different, we used different um, vocabularies and models, including CDOC. So, for instance, um, person and places were a CDOC entity, uh, while other other entities were used, for instance, to represent. Sorry, other vocabularies were used to represent um, other entities. For instance, um, for geographical coordinates for places, we used the geo uh, vocabularies and so on. And what was, of course, useful for the historians was that, was that they could use then they could use the ontology to analyze back some kind of association uh, in the text. So, for instance, relationships ac across people mentioned in the text, like fathers and son, or husbands and wife, widows, and so on. To give a little bit more of a basic example, so in the text we could have a situation where we had a specific person being mentioned, so we would um, encode this manually, and that this, in this information would be extracted to create a person that was associated to that person named in the ontology, and then within the ontology itself, we could have additional information for that person. For instance, that um, he had a wife, and this, this wife had a daughter, and so on. And some of these statements could also be linked back to the text, depending on the structure of the connections. This is yours. It's also interesting to see, related to the previous slides, how this geospatial uh, external element that was used is now on its way into CRM. So this ongoing practical use of the standards also inform the future development of the standards, as we also saw for TI. If we go back to this uh, question of models for and models of, it's quite clear that the main purpose of these standards is to be used as models for. Um, when you do an encoding in TEI, it's very often to make some sort of an addition. It could be a printed edition still, but very often some sort of a digital edition, uh, connected often to an information system. So the modeling purpose has the purpose of producing something. Whereas what is also the case is that these standards were, of course, uh, established as models of, uh, for instance, in the case of CRM, uh, the, the ontology was established based on a large number of real, real existing information systems for museums and cultural heritage. And in a way this defines of the scope of the CRM to the level that things are not allowed into CRM in principle, uh, with some exceptions, if it's not documented in real information systems for museums. So of course even if this mostly is about the creators of the, uh, of the data standards, it still affects how they can be used. And I think it's important to understand both of these perspectives, to understand the differences between the standards, not only how they can be formalized and used, but also how the standards is presented as texts to be used by, by their users. So to look a little bit, going to be a very little bit, into comparison and praxis, we will look into the example of place names. First, TI. Yes, first we have this nice will made by Patrick Zale that attempts to represent the pluralistic model of text. So what Zale says is that text is actually what you look at and how you look at it. So there are very different dimensions that a text can be seen uh, under. Um, his idea is that you might look at a text as a visual object, so a very complex visual sign, or it could be seen as a document, so physical, material, individual, for instance, a manuscript, and the manuscript description associated with that text, or text as a version, which we saw already today quite a few times, as a set of graphs, graphemes, glyphs, special characters, um, or a text as a linguistic uh, dimension, linguistic code, a series of words and speech, or a text as a work, for instance, a rhetoric structure of a text, a narrative structure, and then at the top, text as an idea, as an intention, so the meaning, the semantics of the, te the text. This is useful because it allows us to see, indeed, that depending on how we encode the text, we can focus on different dimensions of the text. So, for instance, if we look at place names in TI, so how we encode place names, potentially, if we have, for instance, an image of, a, let's say, a manuscript, we could use a place name element to encode a specific place name mentioned in that manuscript and use the attribute um, facts, which links to the coordinates of the image where that place name is actually mentioned. So, this is part of the document dimension of the text, so the materiality. 
but we could also instead focus our attention on the rendition of that place name, in which case then we're looking at the graphical representation of that text. Or, I mean, I'm saying or, but of course these are no, these are no alternatives, you could also use them all. We could look at the place name as a linguistic expression and connect that specific place name to a canonical reference, to a, to a formal definition of that place name, for instance, its etymology. Or we could link that place name to the place it refers to, and this is where we are going to link into the semantic aspects, and potentially also to the same world that CDOC CRM is trying to capture. For instance, uh, linking that specific uh, place name to a place defined within an RDF triple. So the idea is just to, to basically show how in TI a name could be, a place name could be potentially representing very different um, perspective on the text. So it could be a reference, it could be a name, use, a reference to a spe specific place, it could be used as a source for nomastic studies or linguistic analysis or etymology, and you could use different elements to express what it is that you are interested in um, with respect to that text. And then of course there are also the semantic aspects which are uh, comparable to what uh, CDOC CRM focuses on. So for instance, again, just to reinforce the idea, if we have the word Madrid appearing in our text, we might encode that as a place name, we might encode that as a, a form, so focusing on the linguistic morphology, and therefore use a specific um, element for that, so we're, sorry, there's no um, end brackets there, or um, in this case, we could focus on the place that place name is associated to. I'm afraid I'm responsible for the lack of end brackets here. Uh, CRM uh, in 20 seconds. Uh, the, the core of CRM as, uh, as ontology, it's the core ontology with uh, some 80 elements, uh, entities, and some 130 properties. It's all organized around uh, temporal entities, events. And those connect to actors, uh, time spans, and so on. And they also obviously connect to places. And those places is then in the class hierarchy of the CRM connected down to place appellations. And a subclass of place appellation is place name. So the place names actually work as um, a reference identifying a place. So very specifically, a place name, for instance, London, identifies a physical place, London, which could be in Canada or the UK or somewhere. And then the place again is identified by this place name. So in order to compare that to how it works in, in TEI, you see that in TEI, uh, the, you have a large number of uh, references to places, place names, within the context of the words, and they are marked up on location in the, in the documents. Whereas in CRM, you see the place names connected to places in the context of an information system uh, modeled, uh, mapped to CRM. Uh, although in TI it can also be data-driven, as we saw previously. Uh, TI is organized as a hierarchy of content objects, uh, but this hierarchy, which is a tree, is then crossed uh, by cross-references uh, linking elements to each other, for instance, the place name to uh, the, um, the element representing the real place, turning the tree into a graph, even if it's still encapsulated in an XML document. Whereas the CRM is a class hierarchy with multiple inheritance forming an object graph in its instantiations. So there the graph structure is a basic characteristics of the object structure. So you can see how TI and CRM are playing different games. TI is expansive in its scope. It could in principle be used to encode any text. Whereas in CRM, auto scope is used quite frequently. It's focused, even if it's used outside that specific domain, it is focused on the museum domain and cultural heritage. In TI, you see how descriptive and interpretative encoding happens at the same level. And many users of the TI would claim it's impossible to really distinguish between description and interpretation. Even the transcription of a text is an interpretation of that text, especially for manuscripts. Whereas in CRM, we establish a set of uh, statements about the world based on the museum information system, and then another layer of calculation can be added to connect that into 
a more formalized truth statements uh, where you can start doing truth calculations. Uh, the discourse of modeling in TEIs is a very loose and flexible structure, and it's usually, with some ex ex exception, structured by natural languages. That is what is encoded. Whereas the modeling discourse of CRM is in the context of a formal ontology. It has strict, although multiple inheritance and multiple instantiation, so the formalization is much stricter. And this, of course, all comes out of the different scopes of the two, uh, the two standards. And what is interesting is to see how the presentation, which is a very important document to all users of standards, the, t the 2,000 pages of TI uh, documents have scope notes for each element, but they have long narrative text describing the use as a process of encoding with many examples, which in a way, it, as a sum, defines an understanding of how to do encoding, whereas in, in CRM you have pretty f brief scope notes with a number of short examples, and they have a number of graphical presentations, both in the standard document and its, as itself, but also implemented as uh, uh, an, a system to visualize the whole ontology in a graphical way. And what is interesting is that that kind of a graphical presentation is currently not available for the TEI. You want to comment that? No, it's no? Okay. Then we're done. Yes, thank you. I will start as a fundamentalist. Uh, whenever you start a project modeling an information object, or what you can call a, a cultural heritage or humanities, uh, could be a document uh, or whatever, uh, in principle, the best approach is to create a specific model for that object or group of objects. Because using a predefined standards, you tend to be steered by what is in the standard. Once this is done, this exercise is done, it's of course important to do the mapping to relevant standards. Uh, it's quite clear that practically and for economic reasons, this process is very often not possible. So using well-informed standards from the outset is often necessary. But I think um, either if the textual scholars would develop something for the museum area or the museum information scholars would develop something for text encoding, that would be an imperialistic project that wouldn't succeed at all. These projects were developed by experts, domain experts, within each of the areas. And I think, although you could have argued that a closer cooperation from the 90s uh, would have been better than starting in 2004, it's still important that not only for practical reasons, but also for political reasons, these things have to come out of their own ground, so to say. And in the integration between CEDOC CRM and Ferber, it was very important that there were both people from the museum, from, from IFLA and from, from ICOM CEDOC, involved in that work. Again, both for practical reasons, because you have to know the standards, but also for political reasons. Yeah, maybe just a practical example related to this to say that when the TI community got together to improve the uh, encoding available for place names, for instance, or person names, and they called the community that was involved with CDOC CRM to see how they did it. Now, 
that, of course, was useful, not just to compare practices, but also to see indeed the differences. So is there, is there, so when, when one is engaged with a specific project, it is very important to know what is behind the standard, because if you don't know what's behind the standard, you don't know what it is that you are modeling and how you're modeling. So 